Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Fabric Spotlight, where we discuss with uh, infrastructure, cloud influencers, everything about cloud infrastructure and enterprise and beyond. Today, I'm really excited to chat with Alan Boehm, who, who has joined the H&M Group as CTO. Hi, hey Alan, congratulations. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to chat with us today. I know you are uh, really booked up, so really pre uh, happy. Well, well th thank you for inviting me. I'm, I'm always, uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, and I certainly enjoy the, the work that the Fabric has done in developing so many young startups over the years. Yeah. Um, you have recently joined uh, H&M as an executive, um, but before we talk about the H&M uh, group itself, um, and you know your prior stints at uh, PNG and Coca-Cola, um, you know driving innovation. You have always been on the innovation path. Um, why don't you kind of share with us and our audience a little bit about your journey, your experiences, uh, how you gotten here? That would be great uh, to hear. Sure. So I, I think I may have taken a little bit of a interesting twist or a different twist than many people to get here in that. You know, I, I went to school, uh, was, was planning to become an attorney. Ah, uh, ended okay. up, <laughs> Yeah, I believe it or not, I was going to be an attorney, decided the world didn't need another attorney. Ah. Um, ended up in, in a marketing department of an airline and recognized quite early on that the analysis that I needed to do was, was fairly complex and it's the perfect thing that could be, uh, be done with a computer. But unfortunately, at the time, the IT department of the airline couldn't do what I needed them to do. Mm. Uh, in the time frame. So I got frustrated and taught myself to code. Ah, and nice. uh, and that, that's how it started. I, I started with that. And the first thing that I worked on developing was uh, yield management systems for the airlines, for the airlines, uh, nice. which is, of course, uh, everybody knows as the person paying next to you is always paying 50% less than you're willing to pay. Yeah, that's but, right. That's right. <laughs> <New building. laughs> that's right. Supply demand and then got involved in loyalty programs and that led to uh, eventually into community cargo systems and logistics systems and uh, eventually worked for DHL, mm. which was the sixth company on the internet, uh, yeah. sixth commercial company and, and just uh, a journey from there and, and, and spent a lot of time going back and forth between marketing and technology, but have, uh, for the last 15 plus years, I've been studying uh, and really concentrating on technology, as you know, with a lot of different industries and, and now, uh, now it's in the fashion industry as well. Mm, yeah, yeah, it's it's uh, quite a journey, and you have touched, I think, just about all the real world things <laughs> that we all interact with. So that's very, very impressive. Very impressive. So um, just wanted to talk about uh, your roles. I mean, uh, you've been focused on innovation, digital transformation. You mentioned DHL, six company on the internet. That is really, you know, very impressive to hear. So uh, what is it uh, that you find uh, what, you know, excites you in this advancing the enterprise uh, business agenda uh, through digital transformation? What are the key tech initiatives and innovations that you're focused on? Well, I, I think you know, the, the advantage is coming across industries is that you can take bits and pieces. I mean, years ago, a consultant said, you know, you're like a bee. You, you go from flower to flower, you pick up pollen and <laughs> And you keep moving along and, and you take the best of lessons learned and, and the best of, 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 of thought. Mm -hmm. And it really, it's almost becomes a, a, a test of neurodiversity just within myself mm -hmm. and, and how I can apply things in a, in a new way. So you know, coming out of this pandemic, um, and we still have a long way to go. And I, I think we, we talk about the, the, what, what's next and the, and the next way of working. But the reality is this is just a stop, mm -hmm. another stop on this journey. Um, there's a lot of lessons that can be learned and applied from that, as well as lessons that can be learned across industries and an opportunity to help reinvent our, the business models, reinvent employee engagement. There's no better time right now to be in tech. And fortunately, uh, I've spent a lot of time in the Silicon Valley spending it with a lot of young startups. Uh, many have, uh, some have gone public, some have had some great exits. But coming from a corporation, we tend to put ourselves in a box. We tend to to think about how things were done as opposed to how things can be done. And this is where the entrepreneurial spirit of outside really can help a large corporation. Mm -hmm. The challenge has always been the acceptance of these new ideas from column the foreigners that are out there that are not part of us 
as a, as a history of a company and incorporating them and scaling them to get to get the business value that we need. And and I think that's what excites me. And I I, I think coming out of the Y2K and Y2K challenges, <laughs> financial crisis in the 2000s, this is just another great opportunity to leapfrog forward and see some amazing new things and see things get adopted now that probably would not have been adopted for five to 10 years from now. Yeah, certainly uh, certain things are getting accelerated. Uh, talk, talk about uh, things getting accelerated. Uh, Fabric, you know, we are of course focused on cloud infrastructure. So we would uh, like to get your thoughts on, um, you know, you have had, uh, you know, PNG and H&M. Um, what are the, <coughs> excuse me, what are the key areas of uh, enterprise cloud adoption that uh, you can say that drives innovation and what are the type of uh, issues that you grapple within that? Well, you know, you know the, the, the major cloud vendors are, it's still a very immature market. Um, they're, they are constantly pushing each other a little bit forward in different areas. But because of the use of AI and ML and, and, and other technologies, we still have a long way to go until that market matures. So um, many legacy applications still cannot run effectively in clouds uh, or take care of, take advantage of the cloudification technologies and capabilities. Uh, we still have a number of consumer applications which have been leading the way um, right. and they're showing us to scale. Mm -hmm. But we still have not been able to defeat some of the basic things, such as latency for the end user, um, although 5G is promising to, to help that. So I, I think we're, we're at another crossroads. And, and I think that we're going to go back to distributed clouds. We're going to go back to edge computing. And then we're now going to start seeing an integration of this um, and really create a new hybrid model that hasn't been seen before. And it's not just about workload management, but it's, it's about differential processing and differential updating. It's about being able to make decisions in nanoseconds in order to yeah. be able to drive commerce and drive behaviors and understand what's going on in the market. So I think we're at another inflection point and, and we have to recognize that this shift is occurring and now we have to start distributing things once again which we yep. did many years ago. You know, yep. we, we always go back to get to the future. Mm -hmm. And then again, we're, we're in the same position. We're back to the future again. Yeah, things kind of like go back and forth. You know, it's kind of like a spiral, right? So, um, so the, particularly one thing that uh, we have heard and we would like to get your uh, take on it is the cloud security, right? Um, uh, it, uh, you know, people have different takes on it, how secure cloud is, what they trust to put on the cloud and what they don't, uh, compliance issues. Um, how are you dealing with that in terms of uh, your internal uh, business units and people like that? So, so I, I was one of the founding board members of the Cloud Security Alliance. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so this has been something that I've been very close to for a number of years. Um, you know, I always like to answer when people ask us, is, is the cloud safe? You know, I, say, I say, look at how many people do you have in your security operations group versus how many people does Google or Microsoft or Amazon or IBM or others have? Mm -hmm. You know, th this, is a, this is a game of numbers. We, we, we know that there's a lot of uh, state-sponsored activities that are going on out there. There is certainly organized crime that's going on, and there are individuals as well. Yeah. And the the challenge is that, you know, you're, you're at a disadvantage no matter where you are. You're probably in a bigger disadvantage in your own data center than you are in a public cloud just because of the sheer amount of money and capabilities that these providers can bring to the table. But you have you have a responsibility to make sure you have the right architecture in place, mm. that you're connecting your internal systems to the cloud properly, that your people have their end user devices secured in, in an appropriate way. There is no perimeter and there has been no perimeter for years. And we just have to accept that. We've now moved into, really, we have to understand there's zero trust. And we have to be able to, to uh, address that as well. Mm. As people are working from home, the endpoints have moved. They've moved outside of corporations and that's not gonna go back in large scale anytime soon. So I, I feel very comfortable 
with the cloud providers. I, I still believe in a layered approach mm. that we don't want to put all of our technology and all of our, our security with one provider at any given point in time. So we do need to layer things in. Mm. We need to be smart. But the weakest link in all of this isn't the computer systems, it's the people. Mm -hmm. And it always has be, been and it always will. Mm. So until we can provide the right education, the right uh, monitoring, the right capabilities and, and have people understand that every action they take either enhances or detracts from the risk profile of your company, um, it really doesn't matter where you are. Mm -hmm. Right. So uh, that, that, that's very good to hear. I mean, especially the part about uh, the education and uh, the layering is a very important concept. Uh, it's a very good um, input, uh, the uh, concept there. So uh, changing topics a little bit, um, how are uh, people dealing with the cloud native applications? Does H&M have this notion of distributed applications, microservices, CI, CD, those kind of things? How are they dealing with uh, management of these things in terms of Kubernetes? Are you using Kubernetes? How are they dealing with um, you know, all these anomalies, thresholds, and all of those kind of things? Well, I think like any large um, company that has, that's, that has a, a footprint, especially a global footprint like H&M or, or, or any of the others, um, this is a journey. This, this isn't a race. You, you're not starting from a, a point of, of nothing and being able to build a, a services-based architecture from the beginning. You're, you're having to transform. You're having to uh, rewrite. You're, you're having to remediate. There's a lot of work to do. So, um, you know, we certainly embrace an agile way of working uh, and, and believe that's the way forward. Uh, but you're not going to change overnight. And, and we, have, we have begun the journey. And that, that was one of the attractions to joining H&M is, is the recognition that, that we can do better, we can move faster, um, but we're gonna also have to do it in a, in a way that's appropriate to uh, take into consideration our investments and our legacy heritage and legacy infrastructure and applications. So mm -hmm. um, yeah, to say that, that, uh, that, that we are far along, no. We were mm. at the beginning, but I think most major corporations that are not tech companies and are not financial institutions are also just at the very beginning of their journey today. I see. I see. So it's early, early days. So, um, uh, Alan, you are a member of uh, the uh, Fabric Cloud CXO Council, and we have had some discussions with you in that regard. And one of the key topics that we talked about was something that you mentioned a little earlier in, uh, in this discussion was this notion about, um, you know, the edge cloud and the services that can be delivered. And particularly, um, we are kind of like uh, looking at how to deal with this global distributed workforce and how to give them a good quality of experience that they had been used to in branches now not being in branches and working from whenever office anywhere type of a concept. And we had discussed that with you. So um, you had some good thoughts on that. So could you share with the audience your thoughts on uh, this distributed workforce, how to give them a good quality of experience, the zero trust security that you mentioned? Well, you know, I, I think as, as we, you know, as companies move into an agile world, I'm gonna go back to that as a starting point. You, you end up with smaller teams. And, and if you have smaller teams, then um, we can easily uh, move to a more of a distributed fashion. So I think the work moves to the people. The people don't move to the work. And just like the compute situation where we're starting to mute, move data to compute, or I'm sorry, uh, compute to data as opposed to data to compute, it's the same thing that happens. So the the, the there is, in most cases, sufficient bandwidth, although in some parts of the world that, that isn't there. Although with things like Starlink that are, that are starting to come alive and others, yeah. we're going to be able to see much more uh, coverage and much more uh, democratize the access to mm -hmm. technology and capabilities. Um, the, if we work in microservices, we do not no longer are talking about long, uh, large monolithic applications right. that have to be regression tested and, 
and required large, large teams to do things. So this is a natural progression. The, the challenge you have, though, is the isolation that can occur yep. um, if we're not careful. And I think there's a good balance that we have to put in place for our teams to look after our people mm -hmm. so that it's not just about work. It's, it's also about how we treat people as a family, how we treat people as a member of society yeah. and, and make sure that, that people are looking after their own health and well-being. Mm -hmm. I, the numbers that I've heard from my colleagues is that since the pandemic, productivity has gone up about 19% mm. with people working at home. Interesting. Some of that, well, and some of that's related to there isn't anything to do. You know, mm -hmm. you're not running out to the movie theater. You're not running out to the gym. You're not running out to do these things. So people have been spending more time at home. And the question is, I mean, that's very, that's great. But is that, is that healthy? Mm -hmm. And I think we need to help redefine the work-life balance for our, our people. And that's, that's part of the responsibility of our leaders uh, of corporations is to assure that we're taking the time to do these things. Right. And uh, when they are working remote, um, you know, they may not have the same quality of experience and uh, you would have to make sure that they are able to be productive when they are working as well, not getting frustrated with uh, slow responses. How, have, you, have you run into any of that and how are you addressing those? Well, I, I mean, I, you know, I think that the tools are still maturing um, and I'm, I'm not going to call any vendors out, but but certain vendors have better for, uh, forward air handling capabilities for their, their video conferencing than others. Um, and and, and those certainly it shows because they were built from a outward in perspective as opposed to trying to serve uh, run on corporate networks to begin with. And, and I, I think that there's opportunities there. I think there's opportunities in improving the call it the virtual whiteboard mm -hmm. and, and how, and how that works. The, the ability to, uh, to create, um, you know, different types of environments that support different ways of working. So huge opportunity in this field. Um, bandwidth is sorting itself out. Again, 5G, Starlink, and other things that are coming online. Um, it'll take a little bit of time. But what we do know is we're, we're not going back. You know, I, I, I will say, you know, I've been, been working remote for probably better than 20 years and uh, for many corporations around the world. Yeah. Um, I've gotten used to it. I certainly have my, my rhythm of how to do that and to work at all hours of the night, depending on, on where, I, where I'm based and where the, the, the corporate office is based. So um, it's just about adjusting. You know, I, I think you, you, have, you as an individual have to learn where to pivot in your life, just like entrepreneurs and startups have to learn where to pivot in the marketplace. And if we apply the lessons learned from them to our personal lives, we're probably better off. Right. Yeah, we um, the fabric. We certainly have a company going in this uh, space, and we have talked to you about that and continue to interact with you on that uh, about that. So um, uh, you talked about pivot and adjusting and all of that. So you have had a series of experiences uh, driving innovation. Uh, so it would be very good to get your perspective on. Um, what is your take on these early stage companies that are seeking to provide these kind of systems, say quality of experience for remote workers to your companies? How, how do you feel about evangelizing these kind of disruptive innovations, early stage innovations to um, the rest of the team? Well, I think as you know, I, I've had a love affair with early stage startups for, for many years. You know, um, was the, uh, the first reference call and, and, and first one to put in um, uh, web methods back in the 1990s to helping Nutanix be formed, to helping, uh, of course, VeloCloud, which is a Velo fabric. VeloCloud, yeah. Velo Thank fabric you very much for company. that. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I always love working with the young entrepreneurs and helping them understand what it takes to, to build a scalable solution for a corporation. Mm -hmm. um, so I don't have any problem walking it into a company. You know, I, I look at the same things that you do and others, and I, it's the team is very important um, because you're going to win or lose with your team. The ability for a startup to listen uh, in order to take direction, um, not overstretching and, and overpromising, because you do only get one shot with a large corporation. You don't want to, you don't want to mislead them. Right. Um, but but by listening, by 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 talking, having the right advisors around you. Um, you have a better chance of succeeding. 
than those that try to go it alone and, and try to do it just their heads down and go forward. So, um, you know, I have no trouble bringing the people in if it's people that I believe in. And it's also the solution is something that that has potential. Excellent. Uh, you actually anticipated my next question with that answer. I was going to ask you about what would you tell to companies on how to work with you and uh, enterprises, but you you kind of already gave the <laughs> hang on answer to that. So it's hit it out of the park. So uh, thanks, Alan, and uh, thank you all for watching and stay tuned for another episode of Spotlight uh, that will come up real soon. Thank you all very much. Well, th thank you for inviting me. Have a great day. Mm -hmm.